morning, everyone, and welcome back for another Sunday, and I hope that you've had a, a good week. I hope, uh, whether it's you or you and your family, that you've uh, been able to have some, some time uh, that has been well spent, and investing in each other, investing in relationships, uh, investing in the things of eternity. And I guess during this time, those are some of the the ideas and some of the things that uh, we want to do is to talk about investing for eternity. So let's pray and then we'll get uh, get started. Father, we thank you for another day and another day to praise your name, another day to, to serve you, another day to be led by the things of your spirit. And uh, we thank you that you walk with us. And Lord, as we give our lives to you. Uh, we pray that uh, the fruit of your spirit would come alive in our lives and in our hearts, in our actions and in our attitudes, Lord. And uh, we just uh, pray that as we center in on your word this morning, that it would just speak to our hearts and uh, that you and you alone would transform our lives and, and instruct us in the ways that we should go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I was looking through the Psalms this this week and uh, this one just spoke to me and I just thought as kind of a call to worship this morning or whenever it is that you're tuning in uh, we're so thankful that you are and from Psalm chapter 86 uh, David says hear my prayer O Lord listen to my cry for mercy in the day of trouble I will call to you for you will answer me among the gods, there is none that is like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. So that's from Psalm 86, uh, beginning at verse 6 and through to verse 11. And I, I just liked how uh, David, in his day of trouble, he calls to the Lord and he asks the Lord for the answers to the things that are going on in his life. And I think that's, uh, that's just good counsel uh, for us. And no deeds compare with uh, that of our God. I love the... The line in verse 9 where it talks about the nations will come and worship before you. And so as we come this morning, I pray that we come not just for information, but we come with a heart's desire to worship. And as we set aside this time um, as a family and as a church family and before the Lord, God, that he would have his way in our lives, that he would have his way in our hearts and that we bring him glory and honor. He is great and he does marvelous deeds. You alone are God. I love this. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And Lord, we pray for an undivided heart and, and uh, an undivided life. So I'm going to just uh, start with a song and I hope I can do this song justice as we maybe settle our hearts in for uh, a time of, of worship and kind of setting the table for the instruction of the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Lofty 
mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art and when i think that god his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart and then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Again, it's good to be with uh, each of you, and if we can't be together face to face, it's certainly good to gather around um, and kind of set the table of the Lord for today, and I hope that as you celebrate um, our risen Savior as you want to and, uh, and commit to walking with Him, that um, you have a, a great and blessed day. I'm going to be looking at... Um, uh, the scripture found in 2 Timothy this morning, and in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 8, Paul is writing to Timothy, and Timothy is a, a young leader in, in a difficult um, ministry challenge and uh, uh, congregation. And so in verse 8, he says, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner, Paul at this time was in chains, but join with me, Paul says, in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace 
was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And just a, a few things that I just wanted to even just highlight for, for us that I have as notes even in, in my um, uh, part in, in this text. I, I just um, underlined or kind of highlighted that this is Paul talking about the gospel and it is a gospel that is of God's eternal purposes, as he says that from the beginning of time that this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus. It's, it's a gospel of eternal purposes that God has in mind for his people. Uh, I also uh, highlighted or circled in verse 10 where it says about Christ Jesus who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It is God calling us to a gospel that is a gospel of life. It is living truth, and it is living truth that can be in our lives and in our hearts, and that can be the power of God at work to change a life, to change it from the inside out. He's giving us life, and life that is here now, and is also a guarantee for life that is to come in Him. He talks in verse 11 of this gospel that he was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. It's a gospel that is also a gospel of service. That as God speaks into our lives, as he invites us into his life, the gospel life, and, and as we take hold of that, he invites us also into a partnership with him and with each other. Paul with, with God and Paul with, with the disciples, Paul now with Timothy. It's a gospel of service. He says, I'm a herald of it and I am a, an apostle and a teacher. And likewise, God calls to each one of us. He says in verse 12, I'm suffering he says, yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And in that portion saying that I know whom I have believed, it is the gospel of Jesus. Paul is saying that it is not my gospel. It is not your gospel. It is the gospel that points us, the, the good news that points us to him who is life, which is Jesus. Jesus is the, the way, the truth, and the life, and he is our way to the Father. And so it's in him that we trust. And then I, I love how he says in verse 14, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. And the, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the, the advocate, the counselor, the, 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 uh, the one who comes alongside us, with a life of Christ and speaks into our lives and tells us the truth about Jesus and tells us the truth about ourselves and empowers our life with the gospel light, the gospel truth and the gospel story. So in this text, in, in uh, chapter one of, of 2 Timothy, beginning at verse eight, I love how when he, when he starts talking in verse 8, he, he says, Don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or be ashamed of me. And he's recognizing that he's, he's a prisoner. He's in chains, but he's really not chained because the gospel can't be changed it, 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 or can't be chained, but it is free. And so he's living. Yes, he's in chains, but he's a free man. And so he says, Join with me, Timothy. Join with me 
in suffering, in suffering for the gospel. Timothy and Paul have this deep connection. Paul has been a, a teacher, a mentor. He's really been kind of like a father figure to Timothy. And I, I kind of get this idea or this sense that, that Paul with Timothy and his family, it was kind of for Paul, almost an extension, an extended family for him as, as uh, we're never told what, you know, what Paul's family is like. We know that he wasn't married, but we don't know what the dynamic was in his own family when he came to trust Jesus as his savior. But along the way and along his ministry path, he crossed paths with many who became close friends and associates and co-partners uh, in the gospel. And I, I feel like for Timothy's family and for Timothy in particular, that's kind of what it became for Paul. So they're, they're deep in connection and in relationship. They work well together. Paul sends Timothy, though, into difficult situations. And he's sending him to be a voice for Christ inside sometimes chaotic relationships and chaotic situations and even times when there's division in the church. Timothy, for one that we kind of see in his character, maybe had a little bit of timidness with him. He was not weak. He was not a weakling. Paul's words to Timothy aren't easy words. They're not easy words to, to share, and they weren't easy words to hear. And what Paul is inviting Timothy into is to share in a life that is a life of suffering. Again, Paul is writing to Timothy from a prison that he is in, in Rome. And the ministry that Paul had was not an easy ministry. He recounted times when he was beaten or uh, in imprisonment or abandonment. And he faced conflict and efforts to discredit his witness. He would die without ceremony, most likely in Rome. And yet Paul considered all of the things that he was to go through, all of the sufferings that he endured, worth it. And his word here to young Timothy is that the gospel made alive in Christ and in our lives now, that the gospel is worth it. The gospel is worth any and all suffering that might come. God's work, his kingdom work, and God's glory can't be taken away. In fact, how followers of Jesus Christ face suffering actually speaks loudly about the God that they serve and the power of this gospel. And Paul's words to Timothy are to be an encouragement. The gospel is worth it. God is worth it. So keep going, Timothy. And I would say to us, keep going, church. Keep going, keep living, keep spreading the message of Christ. And as I've said before, in these times that we face that are challenging, so challenging for us in many ways, but they've created some unique opportunities for sharing the gospel that is so worth it. It's a, it's a calling that is of, of worth whatever suffering and pain can come. And so how do Paul and Timothy endure this? How do they go through it? They, they understand that God and the work of his kingdom to which they're calling them to are greater than themselves. They choose to trust God and they choose to trust him and rely on him in all situations, not just the pleasant ones. There's power in that kind of trust. It causes Paul and Timothy to be different, to be, as Paul describes, set apart for God's glory. To live lives that are lives of significance and purpose and legacy. God saves us. God calls to us. And God gives us grace and purpose. Timothy needs that kind of uh, encouragement. You know, sometimes relying on the power of God can feel like a risky endeavor, a risky thing. 
Because it means that we set aside our own abilities to our own ability to think that we can control things around us and to trust in his abilities. The courage and strength of Jesus, I think, can overcome fear and anxiety. We live knowing that God is greater than, and those of you uh, children that are going to school right now and, you know, and you're going through your your uh, math classes and uh, discovering it maybe in new ways because it's online now. I've got an equation for you. God is greater than. He's greater than anything. He's greater than our suffering. He's greater than our present situation. He's greater than times of loss. He's greater than any times of being alone or feeling abandoned. He's, he's greater than those who would discredit us. So how do people embrace the humility that guides us to, to living lives of grace and strength and courage, even in times like these? I think it's kind of a question of, of weight and, and value. Do we, in other words, do we give more weight and value to our sense of security or our senses of safety or a sense of control or knowledge than we would give to the calling and power of God? What if playing it safe wasn't the most godly action or attitude? How often do our personal wants or the things that we perceive as needs, you know, trump God's will for our lives? In other words, how willing are we to abandon the way of Christ in favor of things like personal safety or stability or wealth or uh, preference or honor or control, those things? And when we see life as a calling from God, that is understood through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, I think we can endure. In fact, I think we can do more than that. I think we can do more than just survive. I think that in times like these, we can really thrive because it's not all about us. And then we can see that God is at work. He's at work actually in these areas of life that we can look back and say, boy, that was a time of struggle or that was a time of chaos. No, it wasn't because God was doing something profound in the midst of it. So let's be true to God's calling and, and see where the Lord will lead even in, in these days and in these times. And I was just thinking about the, the gospel, thinking about the, the life that Christ invites us into. I was thinking about times when on, in his public ministry, times when he intersected into the lives of, of people. And I was drawn to John chapter 4 this week as uh, it's the story of Jesus. And it says, well, he had to go through Samaria. Well, no, he didn't. He had to go through Samaria because he was on mission and because he was about the eternal purposes of God. And so he takes a trip and he allows his disciples to join him on this trip through Samaria. And in this uh, town or in this, this area that he goes to, he meets this woman who is an outcast. She's an outcast, certainly to Jews, but even in, in her, among her own people, the Samaritans, she was an outcast. She was on the margins of life. She was seen as a sinner. And Jesus approaches this woman at a well and he asks her to help meet a need that he has. He's thirsty. He's tired. And so he asks her for a drink knowing that ultimately he's the one who can give her water, living water, eternal water. And I love that how as Jesus is interacting with this woman, it's Jesus that takes the first step. It's Jesus that speaks to the woman first. And it just reminds me that God is a God who is taking initiative in life. 
as 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. So we've got a holy and loving and living God who is choosing to be revealed to us through Jesus Christ. Even though, like the woman at the well, we lead a sinful life. And Jesus comes to her and encounters her and, and he takes the step toward us. But as Jesus takes that first step, that doesn't complete the relationship. See, we've got to be willing to respond to God. We have to be willing to accept the living water that Jesus is offering to us. To walk forward and to trust that Jesus is who he said he was. The Messiah, the Son of God. And he is the one to take away the sins of the world. And he offers, in simple faith and trust in him, he offers us that living water that doesn't run out. So did that Samaritan woman struggle with understanding this and comprehending this? It's like too good to be true kind of stuff. Consider her past. Consider her life situation. There's a, a scholar, uh, Paul Lewis Metzger, that says a lot of men had made promises to that woman. Promises to her in exchange for something. No doubt she's a little jaded. But Jesus offers to the Samaritan woman um, grace. This is neither a deal to be made. It's not a promise in exchange for something. It's unearned. It's beyond generous. It's unfathomable. It's unmatched grace. And the result for the one who trusts? Freedom. A new life. A life lived in Christ in which no one or, or, or one is no, lo no longer required to thirst or search anywhere else for life. For those who may have grown up in the church, who have been maybe part of a, a movement like uh, ours in the, in the Church of God, a holiness movement, uh, on occasion we need to be reminded of the how and the why. We're holy, why? We are holy because God is holy. We are holy not for the purpose of earning a place in the kingdom, not because we can trade our goodness for a cup of the living water. We are holy because God has made us holy. He's extended the invitation of grace. He has set us apart for God's purposes and according to God's will and only by God's grace. We need to be reminded of this often, that God is greater. Let's pray. Father, as we bow our heads and for a moment reflect on our own lives and the life that you have offered to us, God, you are the one and only good Father. Lord, remind us today that you are greater, greater than suffering, greater than inconvenience, greater than insecurity, greater than loss or abandonment or even our sin because we're saved by your grace. And we need to be reminded and we need to be thankful, thankful that we can enter into your presence and that we can drink from your living water because of your sacrifice and because of the grace that you offer to each one of us. Forgive us for forgetting that it's nothing that we've done or nothing that we've been that has caused us to earn your grace. Instead, it's because of you that we can live holy lives, that we can live changed and cleansed lives, committed to following your will. Help us to live into all that you've called us to be. 
In your name, Jesus, we, we pray and we ask you all these things. Amen. Amen. I hope that it's uh, that rings true in your life and that uh, if there's at any point that you need to just reach out to the Lord and uh, where you're at in life, just reach out and, and call out to him in faith and say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the way, you are the truth, and you have the life that I've always wanted. I come to you now. Don't doubt for a second that he is waiting to receive you. That he's waiting to receive you. God bless you this day, and I hope that uh, you uh, live for his glory. Uh, I'm going to ask Rachel, or I asked Rachel to uh, um, do a song for us just to kind of close our, our time together. So bless you, and may the Lord strengthen you in your walk with him. Hey everybody, let's sing together the goodness of God. I've known you as a father.